There we go. There we go. Okay, <clears throat> I guess we'll get started then. Uh, welcome to our our last meeting of the year, and uh, hopefully uh, we won't get whacked like they say that we are. Anyways, just in case, I went and filled up the gas can full of gas for the snowblower. Made sure it started. Okay, <clears throat> uh, calendar for next year uh, for our meetings is is available on the club website. Uh, nothing's really much changed there. Just the same rotation as before. So if anybody here wants to join in the rotation, don't be shy, even if it's just for one or two meetings or whatever, or take a regular routine, whatever you'd like. Always looking for new blood. Uh, which brings me to uh, same thing with presentations, uh, as I mentioned in, in a posting not too long ago. So, you know, anything, uh, you know, a 30 minute one, long one, short one, a five minute uh, little chit chat about some something, maybe a demo of whatever you're doing. That's great. And of course, uh, we've gotten away from show and tells us somewhat, but uh, we're always looking uh, for those kinds of little fillers. Just just let me know so we can put them in. That'd be great. And uh, there's bound to be a cool chip or two coming out this year, I would think, eh, uh, Kevin? I, I've, I've been looking, and I can't find anything. I, maybe the chip shortage is hampering that effort. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, there's lots of exciting stuff at 5G, but... Uh, yeah. We, we don't do too much homebrewing at 5G frequencies, right? No, so. no. That's for sure. Okay. Uh, for tonight, then, uh, we got uh, Michael uh, is going to give us a little presentation on his uh, findings with a cold pits oscillator or his experience with a cold pits oscillator and uh, all the trials and tribulations that were involved with that one. I think you went down some LT Spice uh, paths with that one, too, if I recall, eh, Michael? Yeah, that's right. So uh, that should yeah. be most interesting. <clears throat> okay, uh, are you ready to go, Michael? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, and uh, so uh, you should see you should see that, right? Yeah, we can see that, Michael. You guys seeing something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, so, okay. Um, see the second slide. You see the second slide? Uh, no, nope, not yet. Oh, okay. I'm going to stop sharing and try again. All right. So I'm going to turn the slideshow on. And now, no, that's not good. Sorry, guys, just a second here. Uh, share screen. Okay. Okay, now you can see it, right? You can see the opening screen. Okay, so I'm just gonna go, all right. Well, anyway, um, this is about coal pits oscillators. And uh, can you see the second slide? Yeah, we can. Okay. And um, there's this Barkhausen stability criterion that you, uh, determines uh, you can use to determine whether something will oscillate or not and it basically it's a mathematical criterion that uh, you can use to determine whether a circuit like an app like an oscillator a Colpitz oscillator whatever will wo actually work <clears throat> it applies only to uh, linear circuits apparently and it has they have to have a feedback loop in it loop in it and the the rule is that the magnitude of the open loop gain has to be equal to one for a continuous oscillation has to be greater than one to start and if it's less than one it will go also the um the phase shift around the open loop gain circuit has to be zero so there can be no phase shift between the input and the output so uh yeah whoops so for example this is <clears throat> there's an amplifier here i presume you can see my cursor and uh Amplifier is a gain A, it's got an input and an output, and the output from the amplifier gets fed through the feedback network back into the input. And the <coughs> feedback network gain is B, which is the ratio, ratio of the VF here to V out and the 
amplifier gain is the ratio between V out and V in. And what, what's required with this criterion is that the, the gain, if you break the path here, the gain all the way around here, which is the amplifier times the feedback network gains has to be <clears throat> equal to one. So the amplifier gain is the output voltage divided by the input. The feedback gain is the feedback output divided by the V out here. So A times B has to be one and no phase shift around the circuit. And to start the oscillation, <clears throat> the product of the gain of the two pieces, the amplifier and the feedback network, <clears throat> excuse me, has to be greater than or equal to one. So <clears throat> this is um, a Colpitts oscillator, crystal controlled. There's the crystal, the two capacitors. It's, a, it's an emitter follower amplifier. So it's got a gain of less than one from here to here always for the amp for the amp the transistor itself anyway. So the two capacitors here and the crystal make up the feedback network. The other two here are resistors are to do with the uh, biasing and likewise the emitter resistor here. So there's the feedback. The oscillator part of the circuit is the two capacitors plus the crystal. And the output of the amplifier, which is the remainder of the circuit, is V1. And the feedback network is this piece. So the input to the feedback network is V1 and the output is V2. And it's fed back into the base of the transistor. So if you redraw that, it looks like the original circuit we saw because the, the, uh, the amplifier is at the top and the feedback, feedback network is at the bottom. So when you look at the feedback network, it's a, it's a crystal. So the crystal network, crystal uh, emotional parameters uh, circuit is this where these are the emotional resistors capacitors and inductors and here's the the c0 bypassing it and whatnot so you ignore basically ignore <coughs> the c0 for this purpose and when you redraw this with the crystal here and ignore the <coughs> the capacitance of the crystal here this is what you get so this is your output from the this is the output from the amplifier, which is the input to the feedback network. And this is the output of the feedback network over here. So <clears throat> if you look at this feedback network and you want to calculate the gain, which is um, the B down here a bit more, <clears throat> if you look at the circuit, the output the feedback output is here. It's the basically the the circuit here, the the um, crystal. So V2, given that this is ground, V2 is Ry plus Jxy. And looking at the input from the emitter, this is the the emitter circuit here. It's it's the reactor, the the impedance presented by this circuit. So it's uh, it's R1 plus JXY, <clears throat> RY plus JXY minus this capacitance reactance here. So you calculate the gain just by putting these two together. And then you say, well, okay, this is a round circuit. So the reactance of the, at resonance, the reactance of the crystal is equal to the capacitor reactance of these two capacitors. So having done that, you then end up with a gain, this is B here that I've shown here, and you say, okay, the resistance is very small, this, this R is very small, so you ignore it, so you get the gain is equal to the sum of the <coughs> two capacitor reactants divided by X1, X1, C1 plus XC2 divided by XC2, nice simple formula. So then you look at the, so that's the B for the feedback network, the gain for the feedback network. And now you look at the emitter follower, emitter follower amplifier circuit, which this is the circuit here with the two bias resistors, the emitter resistor on the output. And the small signal model looks like this. And the output voltage here 
is related to the input voltage. It, it's this RE divided by RE plus the small RE plus the large RE. It's a voltage divider, basically. So you go through the small signal calculation and uh, the, the load resistance here is the emitter resistor in the in the emitter circuit, and this is the emitter resistor again, and the small resistance of the uh, transistor internal transistor resistance. And you go through the calculations, and you end up with uh, you know that you know that the smaller emitter resistor is equal to one divided by the uh, GM of the transistor, which is uh, the voltage gain of the transistor, which is basically the emitter. Um, current divided by 26. So you get a formula for the gain <laughs> that basically looks like this. And then you need to know what the output of the transistor looks like. And you go through a bunch of calculations. This is, this, this is what the output of the transistor, the emitter terminal sees. It's got the emitter resistor. To ground, it's got the feedback network in it, and it's got the resistance presented to the base of the transistor. And you go through the calculation, you know that the base resistance is the two parallel uh, uh, bias resistors in parallel, and uh, you go through the calculations anyway, and you end up with this formula. I won't bore you with the details. You end up with the formula down here that says that the load resistance is equal to or roughly equal to the, the one of the um, capacitor reactances squared divided by the crystal resistance, which means that it's it's uh, it's a pure number. So it's uh, there's no there's no phase shift around the loop. It's a pure resistance, which is what the criterion says. So when you come, now you come to calculate the gain, which is A times B, and your A is this formula here. And you plug the B into that formula and you do some calculations and you come up with this, this uh, criteria when you say A times B is greater than one, open loop greater than one, you come up with this formula that says that the, the transistor Transconductance times the product of the two capacitances in the circuit has to be greater than the than the uh, resistor of the, the the emotional resistance of the crystal, and this is how you determine whether it's going to oscillate. You can calculate this, and you can uh, say whether it's going to oscillate or not. And if it oscillates, um, the transistor saturates, and the product becomes one, and away you go. So it meets the criteria. So you also got to consider biasing of, this, of the oscillator circuit as well. And that amounts to figuring out what the uh, resistances are, this RE and these two, the, uh, this one and this one, um, the base resistors. And you start out by saying, OK, I'm going to make the uh, emitter voltage roughly half the collector voltage. So fine, you do that. And, that, and then you pick. You pick an emitter current, in this case, one milliamp. It doesn't really matter that much, but so you pick, in this case, you pick one. And that tells you, given 13.8 volts here, so six and a half here, whatever, that tells you that the uh, emitter resistance has to be, in this case, 6.6K, roughly. And you can calculate this B GM factor we were talking about by uh, using the formula emitter is current divided by 26, so you get 0.038, you got that number. And then you assume that the parallel combination of these two resistances, the bias resistors, has to be less than 10 times this, this uh, emitter resistance here, rule of thumb. And that way the crystal's looking at a high impedance load, so they say. And then you got to pick the capacitors and uh, so how you do that is um, the, the two capacitors are between the base and, and, uh, and ground, and one of them is connected between the base and the emitter, and those two are in parallel, and there, there's a, 
the, the, the base emitter capacitance is in parallel with the uh, one of the two capacitances. So you want to minimize the effect of this uh, base to emitter capacitance. So you say, okay, I'm going to make the capacitor 10, the, the C1, the upper of the, of the two capacitors, 10 times the uh, base emitter capacitance. And for a twin, <coughs> 2N3904, apparently it's around 18 picofarads. So that means your uh, C1 has to be around 180, something like that. So then you say, okay, I'm going to make the two to get equal for convenience. And there you go. And what you find when you go through the calculations is the capacitors are too large, the oscillation won't occur. And um, at um, Eric's place in May, we were fiddling around with a, a uh, Pixie. Was it Pixie, Peter, that, uh, that uh, oscillator circuit? I did some simulations, found it didn't work. And it turned out that I'd picked the capacitor and it's probably 100 times the value it should have been. So it explained why it didn't work. Yes, it was a pixie that we were missing. So picked, Sorry, what's that, Peter? Yes, it was a pixie that we we had up there. Yeah, and I used uh, the the diagram because the design called for 150 picofarads, and I was using 150 microfarads in the simulation. No wonder it didn't work. A thousand times too high or something. So of course it didn't oscillate. As soon as I fixed it, it was fine. Proof of, proof of concept. Then you look at the, one other thing to look at is the, the Q on the crystal. And the Q is the uh, capacitor reactance divided by the resistance. So you get uh, for this particular crystal, which is uh, a 7.04 megahertz crystal, the inductance measured by the uh, SNA actually these are the emotional parameters were measured by the SNA and the inductance is 28, almost 29 <coughs> micro, microhertz and the resistance was 11, which gives you when you calculate everything out for a 7.037 megahertz crystal, you get 120, 120, 125, 120, 112,570 for Q and that's from the SNA. And then you go to calculate, well, what is the Q that the circuit's actually looking at? Well, the resistance in the circuit is larger than the, uh, the crystal resistance because of the external stuff attached to the crystal. And the effective crystal resistance is the sum of the, the crystal resistance itself plus whatever the external stuff is. So you've got to figure out what that external resistance is. And... Um, you go through this calculation where you look at, okay, I've got um, the capacitance in parallel with the crystal is the two, is the series combination of the two capacitors um, in the feedback network plus this base to emitter capacitance. And the resistance between across the crystal is the parallel combination of the two bias resistors, R1 and R2, and also the the emitter resistance times the beta of the of the uh, transistor, and then you get so you calculate those those parallel thing values, and then you convert it to a series equivalent. And there's a formula down here. This is the parallel reactance and resistance. This is the series, and you can calculate the series resistance based on a bunch of formulas. So you go through that exercise. And you find that the parallel resistance is 57k ohms. The that's across the crystal. The uh, the capacitance across the crystal is 80 picofarads. The series combination of the two capacitors plus the base emitter. So those numbers you plug into the formula and you get a a, um, a series resistance equivalent resistance of 1.39. You add that to the 11.37 that your um, your emotional parameters tell you, and now it's 12.76. And you stick that into the formula for calculating Q, and it drops from 112,000 to 100,000. Still okay, still still good. So, um, what I did to test this, I uh, I built a circuit, built a breadboard circuit using my 7.040 megahertz crystal. 
and I looked at the effect on oscillation of changing the capacitors in the two capacitors in the circuit, compared that with, and I'm basing all this on this, this guy, Davidi S0 YouTube video where he talks about all this and that's where all the derivations come from uh, that I've just gone through. So I did that and I compared my results with what the YouTube video says you should get. And he's using a nine volt supply, which is neither here nor there. He's using a 12 megahertz crystal. So he gets um, some results. I get similar results with uh, my seven megahertz crystal. And then, <clears throat> speaking of rabbit holes, I tried to stimulate the circuit in LT Spice. Disaster befell me. Anyway, so um, this is the circuit. There's a, I calculated the uh, resistances here to be R1 to be 56K, R2 to be 67K. That keeps the base pretty stiff and means that the base, the base to emitter uh, the beta does not affect temperature dependence of the transistor is not affected, doesn't change much. We calculated the emitter resistor to be 6.6 .6, and the two capacitors here in the feedback network, I vary over here with the parameter statement, which I learned how to use, thanks to Dave. And uh, so it's easy to change the capacitors. And by using individual, using different capacitor values, you can change the gain of the feedback network. I didn't bother with that, but you can do that. And here's the output capacitor. The capacitors uh, to reduce the output voltage or keep, keep the noise out of the circuit. Here's the crystal and so and whatnot. <clears throat> So I calculated the DC operating conditions. This is with LT Spice, and uh, sure enough, you get one uh, in here someplace. You get one 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 uh, milliamp for the capacitor uh, collector current. So all's good. This is the circuit I built, and um, it's all the components here. There's the crystal. There's the two capacitors. There's the transistor. Bunch of resistors. Um, these are these are the bypass capacitor. Here's another one behind it. You can't see. And these are these are pickoff loops so that I can uh, stick stuff into the scope. And by the way, this this um, you buy these boards and and this is from Charlie Morris uh, ZL2 CTM. What he does is he gets he these boards are probably twice as twice as many rows as you're seeing here. Basically, you cut it to size, <clears throat> and then what? Based on what Charlie does, you make the top rail here negative. This one, these are all joined together. These these points are all joined together, and they isolate from the the rows are all joined together, but they're isolated from the the columns. So you make the negative, you make the top row negative, and you make the very bottom row negative, and that's that's why this loop is here. And then you make the second one down your VCC which is the the, volt, the supply voltage. And if you've got bio, if you've got <clears throat> resistors, um, like a 50, this is a 15 ohm resistor to isolate the power supply from the circuit, it's connected between the, the this positive and, and the, the next line down, which is also positive. And basically you just connect your circuit up. The um, transistor is connected between, uh, this is the emitter line here base is the next one up and the capacitor the co collector is the next one up and the output is taken off the emitter over here anyway it works <clears throat> until it doesn't as i discovered but that's my circuit so this is what i got um i built the circuit and uh this davidi guy says that, okay, if it's, his is a 12 megahertz crystal, he comes up with an emitter peak to peak voltage of 1.36, which is this yellow line here on his scope diagram. His base is roughly twice that, almost twice that. So it's 2.6 peak to peak. That's this green curve here. And um, this is done with <clears throat> by connecting the scope to both the base and the emitter and the uh, you can show that if you 
that the base the base is loaded by the scope and you can show that so my my outputs here there's my emitter the yellow again is the emitter and this is the base and you can see their base is larger by 1.86 times versus his 1.9 and uh, yeah so that they're comparable results and you can see the distortion in this in the, the results because of the transistor going into saturation so you want to get a sine wave you got to put it into uh, pass the output through some kind of filter to get a sine wave so far so good <clears throat> this is my output and yes and the other thing is when you the, the base is loaded by the oscilloscope probe. As soon as you take the oscilloscope probe off the base, the emitter voltage jumps up. So this is what I got for the emitter on its, just using the scope probe on the emitter by itself. So, um, <clears throat> like I say, you find that um, the, the scope probe loads the base, loads the crystal basically and screws you up. And the thing is, how do you get the output out of this circuit? You're taking at least these outputs are taken right out, right off the emitter. Uh, there's no, no following circuit or anything like that. And of course, as soon as you put a 50 ohm load on the output, you drop the emitter voltage almost to zero because of the high impedance that the circuit is presenting to the output, that the transistor, the oscillator is presenting to the output. So you really can't measure it. What I was hoping to do was put it on. Uh, a spectrum analyzer and look at look at the um, the uh, harmonics and whatnot, but I couldn't do it because it just just doesn't work. So you got to put some kind of matching network or something, and I haven't really figured that out yet. Well, this table shows some calculations um, based on the, the variation that you get <clears throat> depending on the capacitance values you pick for C1 and C2. This is the 180 which gives you this, this is the GM times XC1 times XC2, and this is the resistance <coughs> of the crystal. So the relationship, the ratio of those is 53.6, nice and high. And uh, Davidi points out it has to be high in, in order for the circuit to oscillate. So yeah, it oscillated fine, gave me three, three volts. Then I tried a five, two capacitors, 510 picofarads each, and this ratio goes down to 11.36, and then yes, it's still oscillated. And the output voltage dropped by a factor of almost 10. Go up again, um, this ratio goes to 6.6. .6. It still oscillates, yeah, but the, the voltage output now is 138 um, uh, millivolts, rather. And you go any, you go start going higher and higher, like a 10, 10 nanofarad, doesn't oscillate at all. <clears throat> and my 150 micro 150 microfarad capacitor didn't either. I didn't bother to put it in, but like you can I did I did these tests and you can see what happens. So this is my LT spice and this is where things got hairy. Um, hopefully you can read the table, but basically this is the um, this is looking at the uh, Oops, sorry. This is looking at the the um, using the view function to look at the error log. And I've got the formulas in here that determine what the um, emitter voltage peak to peak is, and what the base voltage is peak to peak. And uh, you can see that there, and down here the table down here, it's getting one volt peak to peak on the emitter instead of two almost three so they're ensued with peter's uh, discussion with peter about well what's going on here were there any mistakes in in the circuit would appear not so uh, the frequency is fine but the voltages don't match and the frequencies the crystal by the way was a 7.04 megahertz crystal comes in in this circuit is 7.037 close enough megahertz and uh but the voltage in the in the observed voltage is almost three times the simulated voltage and at this point we have no idea why what we did um 
we tried playing around with the emotional parameters of the crystal. We changed the resistance, up, the resistance up and down quite a bit. No effect to speak of um, that we could see. I changed the transistor beta. It's it's 300 nominally. I actually checked my transistor because I thought it burned out burned out a transistor. I checked it and it was a 219. Now Peter's measured three. I think it was three transistors and got 434. So I tried 434 in the in the in the LT spice circuit. No difference. What does make a difference is the capacitances, as you'd expect, because that's the way the circuit's designed. But I couldn't find anything else. So I don't know, not obvious. So uh, this is contrary to what I've found other times with, let's say, an amplifier circuit. It's pretty close, but this is just no way. So I don't know. So um, one of the things I want to do is is put an amplifier on the circuit. There's a buffer amplifier that that. Um, talked about you can try that you can put a matching network maybe put a, a linear common emitter amplifier output on it and i also want to figure out how to set it up with a spectrum analyzer but i have to do these other things first also got to fix my dead oscillator circuit and i'm going to stop there anyway that's um that's what i did so uh interesting exercise going through the calculations to figure out, I'm going to unshare the screen, figure out how to derive these formulas. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, <clears throat> I know we spend a lot of time talking with that, uh, about that spice simulation. That was quite interesting. The only thing I think I'm trying to remember where we left off with it. And uh, I think what was left with my mind was the difference between the real world and LT spice was those capacitors, but uh, to be determined, I guess later. Uh, Dave, you have a question. Yeah, more so comments, uh, Michael. A couple comments. Your beta is way, way too high for a thirty nine oh four. Okay, um, I don't care what a yeah, transistor I actually measure it. Yeah. I don't care what a transistor tester says. You got to go back to to the data sheet. And the data sheet says you're going to get a maximum of about 300 at 10 milliamps and one volt VCE. That's that's your bias point. Now I think you're running at five milliamps. No, one. One milliamp. One. So there's no way you're going to get a beta of 300. No way, right? So your your the Q point your where 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 that transistor is biased is you can get a much lower um beta okay because i i calculated your beta based on that dcq point analysis which i hate that by the way that lt spice does that operating point i absolutely hate that because uh i wish it would tell you what the beta is for a transistor but it doesn't and your beta comes out to over 300 330 something 340 which is way above what the maximum the data sheet says Right, so that's number one. Number two is you haven't accounted for Miller capacitance in your model. The 3904, I was looking at the data sheet now, it's got a uh, output, the CB, CBO capacitance of four picofarads. And that's the capacitor from, do you, do you know what that capacitor is, Peter? Is, or, that, um, is, that, is, that, is that the capacitor between the base and the collector? Right, right. And so Miller, Miller theorem says that any, any network, anything you've got between the collector and the base, it's equivalent of taking that and connecting it to ground, to the base, and multiplying it by beta plus one. So if you your beta is the form of beta, the yeah, four so figure times uh, beta plus one. Right, and so this is a common collector amplifier. Your yep. your amp your gain should be one, because uh, if you look at your your base to emitter, right, the junction there is yep. 0.7 volts. 
So right. they, they call it a, what's it, a emitter follower? That's the emitter right. yeah, always the gain follows awesome. the base. So that's why you get a that's gain right. of one, right? So what whatever that's the right. base yeah. voltage is at, the output voltage is going to be 0.7 volts below that. So it's going to be almost the same, right? So your gain yeah. is one. So uh, I think you need to take that four picofarads, multiply it by two, gain of one plus one, two, you get eight picofarads and put that to ground. Now, LT Spice is doing that for you. When you run an LT Spice simulation, LT Spice takes that into um, consideration and it's cal cal calculation. So when you play around with your capacitors in terms of deciding what values to use, you got to look at that and see if that makes a difference. It may not, but it may make a difference because that goes in parallel to ground with the existing capacitors you've got, right? Is you it, understand? You're not, not talking the basic. You're not talking the base emitter resist capacitance. You're talking at one to ground. No, 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 no. That's it because Miller says if you've got a capacitor between base and collector, okay, mm -hmm. it's the same as putting that capacitor from base to ground. It's okay, the across the two except series. The value, yeah. Okay. Except the value, you multiply it by beta plus one. No, sorry. <laughs> the gain plus one you take the gain plus one and multiply it by that capacity by that capacitance and it's the same as putting that capacitor from base to ground okay I'll have so to look now at you've it. got in your model your cal calculations you haven't accounted for that capacitor so i don't know if that capacitor is going to make a big difference in your calculations, I don't know. So what did you say, Dave, then, that LT Spice is taking that into account for you already? Yeah, LT Spice, oh, LT Spice does all that. I've proven it. I've done calculations. That's that's what I've been doing for the past, for the past two or three months. That's why okay. I've been quiet. Okay, make sure that. I've been looking at. So then, I've been looking at. So you don't have to physically add in that eight picofare capacitance in there because Spice no. is doing that for you already. Yeah, but that's only for a common collector amp. If you've got a common which is what this emitter amp, which you could have a gain of 10, all of a sudden that that capacitor becomes 10 times the value. And that's why common emitter amplifiers short out at high frequencies is because of Miller. Mm -hmm. It's because of that Miller capacitor, right? We don't take it into account for that. Like, for example, you look at, there was a good Charlie Morris, he, you uh, mentioned Charlie Morris. Charlie Morris has got a, this great video where he builds this amp and it works perfectly at seven megahertz. He gets the gain coming out and everything works out and he goes and it comes out just, you know, within a few, within 10, 10%. Then he runs it at 14 megahertz and it shits the bed. <laughs> It's like it's way off. And he goes, well, it's it's okay. That's good enough for me. Well, it's because he didn't account for Miller. Another rabbit hole. So you're saying that so you're saying that the what you're what you're implying is the LT spice is right, I think. Yes. If, and yet if I'm getting spice, vastly different results. So if I account for the Miller effect. What would that you do may find me? you may find a better you may find a better result, but that's provided the Miller capacitor is making a difference. I don't know, Michael. I don't know. The Miller capacitor well, I know, may, I know. Not be, may not be making. I don't know if you put like it's roughly it's going to be of of the order, but eight picofarads. If you put eight picofarads in parallel with those other capacitors, is it going to change it? Is it going to de detune the, the circuit? That I can't answer. So if, yeah, okay. So if this Miller effect is actually behaving, if the, if the actual circuit is behaving as per this Miller effect, then you'd expect to find that it would be closer to the LT spice maybe. I don't know. 
Well, no, if you put, yeah. if, you put if you put that eight picofarads across those capacitors on the L, in, in the LT spice simulation, then the output's going to go down. So it'll make it even worse. Well, yeah, Dave, so Dave, says, Dave says that the, L, the, the, uh, the Miller effect's included in the design, in the, in Here, the LT let me space show simulation you. already. Let me show you so, something. Here's, I've been, I've been building this spreadsheet in terms of how a JFET, how to design a JFET amp, okay, how to define a MOSFET amp, how to define a BJT common emitter amp, and here's a common collector amp. And here I calculate what the uh, Z out is, okay? And what, what the Z in is, okay? And if you look, I have to take into account Miller. The Miller capacitor, I take the gain plus one, multiply it by G5, cell G5 and G5 is my uh, COB, my output capacitance, which is eight picofarads. And it makes a huge difference because if I was to take that out, okay, th this, this here, 97 ohms is dominated because of, of, of that, that, uh, um, impedance there. Because if I didn't have that, I would get like my, uh, RB would be 729, you know, and my combination of my uh, beta times my uh, little RE times big R, RE comes out 3,700. So if you look, just the capacitor impedance from both capacitors, the input and output capacitors is dominating the effect. It's dominating the input impedance. And if I hadn't accounted for that, and I just use what everyone says to go and use. Oh, just use beta times little re times big re. I would get this value, and I'd be going. I'm supposed to be seeing 3.7 k, but I'm but you know, and I'm seeing like this. This number is about right in in LT spice. It's about like 20 percent off, but it's of the order of magnitude. It's below 100 ohms. Yeah, now that's for a common collector, <clears throat> which yeah, is what this is. All for you a common emitter. Common emitter, same thing. Same thing applies. And hmm. that's that's why, you know, that's why these amps. And I, I was I was racking my head. Most of the designs for transmitters you see are are eighty meters or forty meters. There's a reason for that. Okay, and that's because the Miller effect at those frequencies is not that great. Once you get up to 40 megahertz and higher up to 30 megahertz, the Miller dominates. And that's, that's why you the focus build an amplifier at that frequency. Well, that suggests that this circuit, which is this oscillator, which is running around seven megahertz, maybe is not affected by that Miller effect. And it I don't could know. Be. And it could be, but 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 you were saying that you're playing around with with capacitance, and you found that if you didn't have the right capacitance, it wasn't it wouldn't oscillate. So automatically, as soon as you said that, it triggered in my mind mm. about Miller. Did you account for Miller? Mm. Now you did account for in one of your slides. You did account for the capacitor from base to emitter. That's right. That's right. That's how you figure out. Basically, you, you say there's a capacitance in there, and then you uh, right. you make the oscillator capacitors ten times that to get away and from the that. And the data sheet, and the data sheet agrees with that. That's that's correct. Let me just. Uh... So if you look at the data sheet here, see you've got these two capacitances here. You accounted yeah, the for 18. the CBO, which is 18 picofarads, yeah. right? But you didn't account for the yep. base uh, collector that's capacitor, right. which is four picofarads. I don't know whether that's going to dominate this. Now, and what I was saying about the beta, look at this line here. See, it says for IC at 10 milliamps, VCE of one volt, 
Mm -hmm. your, mm -hmm. your beta goes from 100 to, to 300. If your IC is one milliamp, it's 80. Your VC is yeah. one volt, your beta is 80. That's a big difference. Huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Right, so so I think that's that's uh, one of the things, maybe because your your impedance is you're using beta times, you know, because that that one over GM is I think that's isn't that related to beta? GM is equal to one no, plus beta yeah. divided by beta or something like like that. I have to go have a look at that. Yeah, yeah. there's there's some kind of there's something uh, like like that. GM and beta are kind of related somehow. Well, hi, yeah, you look at you look at the uh, the the, the uh, small signal model of the transistor, which has uh, has a current source and the currents the in the collector, and that is the current the collector current times the um, base current, and you can convert that into this GM formula in which case it's kind of thing from base from a current related could, to voltage related yeah or you could, or you could use beta ic that uh, beta ac because if if you look here see you got this transition frequency and yeah, it says yeah. transition frequency is 250 so at um at one megahertz your beta is 250 at 250 megahertz your beta is one so and at seven one, megahertz is about 80. right right it's, so then yeah. so that beta ac so then in your in your small signal model instead of using that gm you could use beta ac little ic ib little ib right and your mm. beta ac is this number times little ib your your AC current, not your DC IB, right? Yeah. It, it's it's listen, man. I have been I have been banging my head against a table and a wall for the past three months trying to figure this shit out. And I tell you, I, 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 I may sound as if I know what I'm talking about, but I don't. <laughs> 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 I don't because yeah. every time every time I run a bloody simulation, something doesn't work. It's like, oh, I thought I understood this. <laughs> <laughs> Back to basics, yeah. Yeah. Welcome yeah. to my world. <laughs> Maybe the secret is to stop analyzing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I guess that's why that's why people build circuits that other people built, right? Because they work. They don't have to do do the calculations. You don't have to bang your head against the wall. But um, I have a flat head. <laughs> and it's looking better all the time. The more you hit it, the better it looks. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you're talking about not taking an account for some capacitance, Michael, you mentioned there that you didn't take in, you ignored the capacitance of the case on the uh, crystal. But in reality, isn't the, doesn't the capacitance of the uh, CO represent about, I think, two or three or four picofarads? It's five, uh, two five. and a half, two and a half. The uh, SNA results came out two and a half, but you know, I didn't, I didn't include that in the, in the, uh, in the analysis. Pro you know, I, I basically followed what this on the YouTube video did, and mm -hmm. he completely ignored that to simplify things. I guess. Well, he didn't do LT spice yeah. simulations, though, did he? No, he didn't. That's right. He no, he, he basically went derivation built the circuit and showed that what he got in the circuit was what he thought of in terms of yes it works and it gives you two times the base voltage is twice the emitter voltage blah 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 and uh he didn't bother to do an lt spice simulation and I you were happy until you did an lt spice simulation but now that you've done this lt spice uh, simulation now you got a lot more work to do here <laughs> yeah dave is that is that um uh, is that spreadsheet something you could send me? Is something that I can yeah. figure out, Michael, look at, and figure out what? You got? Can you do me a favor and can you just flash that schematic you've got with the values on the screen so I can? Just oh, the, the schematic. Sure. Let me okay. let me go back and share it. Hang on a minute. Yeah. Uh, share. Because I'll I'll tell you what what your beta is. 
Uh, I'll tell you, I, it'll uh, take me like five minutes. Share. Okay, let's see. Oh. Ah, where is it? Let me go back up here. You want the actual values, right? Yeah. There's the circuit, there's the gain. Oh, the LT spice circuit, of course, is what you want to look at. Just let me find it here. Well, if you just show me the, the schematic and, and tell, tell yeah. me the values you used. Right here. So, okay. Okay. Can I just take this a snapshot of that? <laughs> yep. Okay, and so what values did you use for your capacitors there? 120, 120, 180 picofarads. So and that's C1 because is, C1 is C1 180. 180. And the reason it's 180, the reason it's 180 is because the base to emitter capacitance is 10, is, is uh, 18 rather. And to eliminate the effect of that base emitter capacitance, you make C1 at least 10 times it. That's why I picked it. And what's, he and used what's a, and, and the same, the same value. Changing the ratio of C1 and C2 changes the gain of the, uh, the feedback network. And R1, basic. R1 is um, 56K, 67. Okay. And 67 is R2? That's right. 67K, right? That's right, yeah. Both in the K, yeah. And R, R is, is all 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 okay. Dave, you said 67K. No, 6.6K, I think it is. No, so, no, no, no. R2, R2, R2 is 67. R, RE, the emitter resistor, is 6.6. Oh. And that was chosen to get the base, the the uh, emitter voltage to be half the collector voltage, half VCC. That's why I picked it. Okay, uh, leave me alone for, for a couple minutes and I'll tell you what, what the DC model of your, of your transistor looks like. Okay. Well, in the meantime, uh, um, <clears throat> you remember that number, you used the number 26 in your math on slide 10 and 13. Where did, they, where did that number 26 come from? It comes from the... Uh, it's the fundamental model of the transistor that number comes from. It's 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 related to the temperature dependence of the it's KT divided by Q, whatever I forget what those are, but that's where it comes from. Okay. And uh, that's what you use. Yeah, that's the the internal emitter resistance of the transistor is the emitter is six, is this number twenty six divided by the emitter current. That's how you use it for things like that. Okay. And the other thing that, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought there was a phase shift in the uh, in emitter follower amplifier. No. Well, it, 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 if you use it this way, no. No. Okay. It, you, look, used in this oscillator circuit, no. And that's what the derivation shows when you go through it. Okay. The phase shift around the trans around the transistor, mm -hmm. the, the amplifier is zero. Much easier to use the dot measure statements and the uh, variables, isn't it, Michael? <laughs> yeah. Although I I did both. I did both. <laughs> Just to see. Anybody else have any comments or uh, questions for Michael? Well, I certainly know, Michael. It was what, uh, I, what I don't know. By the way, what I what I don't know is why I had this I had this circuit working, the, the actual circuit working, and I was getting twice twice the voltage. The base voltage was twice the emitter voltage. Everything looked hunky dory. 
and then one day something happened and the scope the scope mm -hmm. shows the emitter voltage being much higher than my original simulations were like oh. in the 10 volts plus kind of thing but the base voltage when you put the scope on it is zero go figure haven't figured that out yet so i thought okay i fried the transistor so i took the transistor out and replaced it that didn't work oh then i replaced the crystal that didn't work either so i don't know what i've done in the meantime i've got a dead circuit what i'm going to do is rebuild it from scratch yeah i was just thinking maybe you got a short probably, probably with yeah I, go, I wonder i can't find it oh. but one of the things about this uh, board that uh, charlie morris uses the the way i've put parts on the board they're very close together and i wonder if there's some shorts i can't see or whatever so when i rebuild it i'm going to spread things out a bit well if you're getting 10 board, volts so. at, uh, at, on the top of re that certainly seems to suggest a short is that what you said you were getting yeah, I, I don't know i it's it's weird it doesn't make sense yeah i don't know something's wrong anyway because it worked before I ran the same oh, process. It doesn't work. It, it didn't work. Then I finally got it to work. And then I went back to do some more testing because it was working. And it's back to not working again. So I ended up uh, redoing all the solder joints. I replaced, uh, I saw a little bit of a funky uh, IC socket for one of the mixers. So I replaced that. But uh, still not, <laughs> still not working. But, uh, and then, Christmas stuff got in the way, so I haven't gone back to it yet, but but shortly after Christmas, I think I will. <clears throat> but it's frustrating for so sure. What I, was gonna, what I was going to do was build one of these, uh, you know, lay one of these boards out so I can play with different circuits, like the common, common emitter amplifier circuit and stuff. So I'm going to redo this anyway, redo everything and see what I get. Yeah. And if it works, fine. If it doesn't, I give up. <laughs> So there's the C0 2.62. <coughs> what was that? Sorry. The C0, as you can see, is 2.62. Yes, you got that in there. Okay. And what David's saying is that I think what he's saying is the the Miller effect capacitor is between the base and ground. So it's in parallel if you like, with the combination of C1 and C2. Right. I suppose. But if he's saying, if if he's saying that LT spice accounts for that, then that doesn't make any sense because no, that, that it does, fair enough. As well. when, when he was saying that the LT spice takes that into account, then that 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 actually now makes things worse. As far well, as- Well, that's right. It, 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 but, but the thing is, reality, if if reality is what I actually saw on the board, it differs significantly from LT Spice. And I don't, don't know why, unless that capacitor somehow makes things go the other way. I don't know. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Uh, no, I'm still sharing, Dave. Hang on a minute. Let me, let me just stop sharing. Okay. So here's the here's the transistor you you did right. Oh, it's oh it's a thirty nine oh four. It's a thirty nine oh four, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So here's your Q. Your, your Q is three hundred and eighteen. Okay. So your VB. Sorry. What's the oh uh, the beta the beta is uh, the beta is your IC is, divided by IB yeah the beta is, yeah is where do you see that oh okay yeah here's your VB your VB is seven volts right and so your That's VB right, around that. uh three point seven volts below that right which is six point seven That's right yeah right yeah it, yeah and this is roughly IC, what I got your IC is one milliamp which is what you you, this is biased, so this That's this, right, here, yeah. this network here is setting your VB, and it's setting what current is going to be coming out of here. Your voltage that's set here, uh, um, your your RE, is going to be setting that, right? 
because Not you started yeah. with here and beta times the no sorry your no sorry your voltage here on VE is six point seven six divided by and VB's got to be 0. 0.7 above that. Okay, right, and that's why you get one milliamp. That's six point right. yeah. seven volts divided by six point seven K, you get one milliamp. That's right. Okay, so now you take your beta and divide that by beta and you create your bias network here to put that current coming into IB. So you realize that current. So you have to change these resistors here to bump up the current coming through here and uh, change your, your beta. Okay. Well, the other thing I don't like is the fact that you've got this resistor here. Because that resistor now is becoming part of your collector. That's right. That resistor is there. From what I understand, looking at EMRFD, they talk about that resistor as being the intent of that is to isolate one stage from another if you've got a multi stage. Right. It's, a, it's an RC filter. It's this in combination with that. You've got an RC filter. So at AC, you've got a ground here. At AC, you've got a that's ground right. catheter, but not at DC. At DC, that's open circuit. So at DC, that's right. you've got 10 ohms coming through here, and the 10 ohm, well, it's split between here and here, right? So the current coming down well, is- All that 10 ohms, what the 10 ohms does is change change the uh, voltage of the positive side of C22. Yeah. C22 See, with me, what, what I like doing here is I like putting in an inductor, a choke, putting in a choke okay. and making that making that say, you know, you know, 10 micros or something like that. And that, that becomes your, your okay. RFC choke, right? And this becomes the ground. Yeah. There's very little resistance here. So you got all your current. I don't think it's going to make a difference. Your beta is still going to be the same, right? Beta is still 318. Your IC is, is basically the same, right? It hasn't changed not, much. Not much. Okay, but well, yeah, it's not there at DC anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, your beta is way too high. And like, uh, if you look at your VCE, so where's VC? Minus VE. So here's your VCE. Your VCE is seven volts, right? So your VCE is, okay. is seven volts. Now, if you take a look at the of the Q point for that, right? You're saying that you know you got that. If you go and you look at the uh, where's my uh, three nine zero four here. Jesus, what did I do here? For crying out loud! Let me just let me just take another transistor here and. I want input characteristic. Where's input? Here it is. Yeah, this is what this is what I want. So let's change this to uh, 2N3904. I got it backwards. There it is right there. Yeah. We, we run this. And let's make this uh, going up to like uh, five volts. And let's run this. And so now if you plot your current as a function of VBE, as a function of uh, VB, which is VBE, because this here is a short. I just put that resistor in as a current sensing resistor, right? It's a short. VE is at mm -hmm. zero, right? So if you look at seven volts, oh, we should go to seven volts. 
let's go up here to, to eight volts or something. Because your VC is at uh, seven volts, right? Oh, no, sorry, that's mm -hmm. VBE. We want to change this to VCE. Uh, how do I do this now? Yeah, anyway. So, but if you look at your input characteristic curve, right, for your IC based on your IB, your VBE, right, this is what you're going to get coming out, right? So you're way down here. 3904 is way down here because there's no way you're going to get one amp coming out of 3904. But if you go and you plot IC against VCE, right, and you look at seven, um, seven volts, right, uh, then that gives you um, what your uh, current is going to be, your IC is going to be at that bias point. So, and that bias point may be too high. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, uh, I do have a... I'm not sure I do, but okay. I'll have to think about this. I've got an output characteristic. I think I understand what you're saying, Dave, but the issue here really is, is the, is the real world circuit not agreeing with the uh, LT Spice one? But, but it's, it's, it's all a matter of biasing, right? So here, if we plot uh, IC, see, this is, your, this is your plot. So here's your VCE. So this here now is your VCE at the bottom. You've got seven volts. Change the right? transistor. Now, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, it, but if, if, if you look at this, and you look at what your IB is, and that's your Q point. So for for a thirty nine oh four, you know you might be way you might you might be be biased way outside what it should be biased at. That Q point. That's why beta is so important, right? Yeah, but the whole yeah. Oh wow! So you're so Look you're there. getting like one milliamp. You're you're biased way down here. That's your bi That's your Q point is way down here. See that green line? So yeah. In terms of your signal, how far your signal moves, it doesn't move very far off of that, right? So that's what that's what that's yeah. what I'm kind of saying. So the bias thing should be way down. Yeah, your your but bias is an thing, awesome your bias point could not not be at the correct spot. But this this is this is not an oscillator. This circuit it's just a standard transistor amplifier, right? Right, right. And so all all transistor amplifiers, you got to choose your cue point so your signal is within this region here. Right now, that's for if yeah. you're changing a lot of milliamps, you've got a small signal, but your bias at one milliamp, you might be, that's why it may be dropping into cutoff, right? So you mm -hmm. may need to bump up your current a little bit higher. And with a higher current going through the uh, collector, you may get a better, um, you may get a better response, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? I'm having trouble following, but that's okay. Um, I so I would have to try a different, basically bias the transistor differently in the simulation and also in the real circuit as well, to, because we're comparing real circuit with simulations here. Yeah, but this this simulation here, I, I like. It'll take take me a while to figure it out. I can't do do this on on the fly. I got to figure it out, right? I but can't uh, but um, I think what it might be, Michael, is that the bias point, where where am I here? I'm over here, stop sharing. Okay, the, yeah, the I bias think your point in the bias point is, is, is down way too low. That's what I think. Well, I could certainly, I could certainly try it. Let's say ten milliamps and see what I get. I, you know, I, I build yeah, like, to get ten, change, 10 milliamps. Change those, 
change those bias resistors so that you'll get like uh, uh, 10 milliamps. Um, you're, you're allowing collector the, the collector to be 10 milliamps, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, I'll, tr I'll try that and see. Yeah, try, try that well, actually, and uh, actually, maybe that might work. Work in the sense that the simulation matches the actual which is what I want to see. Yeah. And if it does match, then the question now becomes is why didn't it match down at 1 milliamp? But that's a story for another day. Did you, yeah. did you measure the actual circuit you built? Did you measure the DC current going through the transistor? Well, yeah, because I measured, I measured the actual emitter voltage to be something in the order of seven seven uh, <coughs> seven volts i actually measured that uh, i took the i took the crystal out so i wasn't being faked out by the uh by the oscillations in the circuit took the crystal out to get the dc point, which is what we're talking about here and i got at a voltage around seven volts roughly and the 6.6k resistor gave me the one uh, Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, that's that's as much as I know about this this stuff, right? I, I know that the that bias point is in the designs I've been looking at. You got to get your bias point right because if it's not right, you end up with your wave clipping at the top or bottom, and you get a whole bunch of distortion. Which which affects which which is why you get a distorted output out of the transistor. Yeah, yeah, because right? because you're driving the transistor into saturation or cutoff, right? Yeah, that, that's why that's why it's not that, that's why it's yeah, not a sinusoidal output. I think in this case yeah. you're probably driving it. Is there does does the data sheet have a minimum IC? I'd have to go look. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll have another look. No, it doesn't. Well certainly got a couple of good ideas to uh, try out there, Michael. That'd be interesting if you can get rid of those. Yeah. That would be good to get rid of those uh, distortions as well. Yeah. Okay, something something to play with. Okay. So, Dave, could you Dave, send there, could I've, you send that? I've uh, monopolized the entire meeting once again. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you say something profound, I don't mind listening to you. Well, that was very good. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, Dave, for your uh, your feedback yeah, on that. That's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's pretty good. Although I still question as to you know why Spice is not agreeing with the circuit. No matter no matter whether or not you we've got the theory right, it would have been nice to see the two circuits agree a little bit better. But I think something's you know with everything, but something must be missing in the Spice simulation to make it not agree, though, right? Yeah, and a lot of times, Peter, it's the it's that crystal. It's you know to to model a crystal in uh, LT spice, it's and tough. maybe it is as you said, it's the case capacitance. Maybe that's yeah. what's causing the issue. Right? But you know what, Michael did do a fair bit because when we had that discussion back, whenever it was, we did change a lot of parameters on the uh, in that crystal there, and it did not have the uh, desired effect. Well, but anyway, well if 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 the if the not to belabor it but if the if the case capacitance matters then that capa that case capacitance is in parallel with the lower of the two the, the the capacitor but it's in it's in parallel with the capacitor between the base and ground in the circuit so instead of having 180 you'd have 180 in parallel with two which would give you 182 which is a significant difference. And you know what else they didn't take into account for? The construction technique of building that oscillator. You know, there could be straight capacitance on the board that are not accounted oh, for. Oh, all over the place. That's right. I did I did not do what I probably might do is uh, drill little holes to make to, to break up the traces. I didn't do that. Yeah, I know. Etch a board. Mill a board. Oh, right. Speaking of milling boards. 
Well, no, first, okay. Does anybody else have any comments or questions for for Michael on his uh, <coughs> on his uh, oscillator? Okay. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, I learned a lot there. Or I've been Thanks exposed. Comments, uh, I still have a lot more to learn. I should say. <laughs> oh, likewise. Um, yeah. Dave, uh, I just mentioned briefly there about uh, uh, milling a board. Did you ever get around to milling? Board, your board yet? No, I still haven't gotten a design to mill. I'm still trying to develop a design. Okay. Oh, so you haven't even done any test uh, test stuff just to see how to play things out yet? No, I, it works. I've done done a few passes. I've got it working. I've got like the zero point. It spins up. I could send it commands, and it it works fine. It's just a matter of going through and milling a board, but I don't have anything to mill. I don't want to go mill a board for the sake of milling a board. I want to mill something that uh, um, I'm I'm ready to go and test, right? Yeah. Well, I just took a small board, and I just did a little small test to get the, uh, you know, just to get a feel for what kind of uh, settings I needed to do to produce a, a reasonable, reasonable board. Okay. What's that saying? That necessity is the mother of invention. Something so like once that. I have necessity, once I have something to do, that'll drive me figuring out how to go do it. Well, the first board I did, Dave, was not a real board. It was just a it was just a little squ uh, quickie schematic uh, PCB layout of a few traces of a few different sizes, and then just milled that just to get a feel of what I needed to do before I went anywhere near an actual circuit. So anyway. Who's uh, who's Mr. Null? Is that you, Dave? Two Nulls? Anyway. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have anything else they want to add in for uh, tonight's meeting? Yeah, it's probably Dave. Okay. He does that kind of thing. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, I guess... Uh, I guess if nobody else has anything else to add, we'll close off tonight. It's uh, good seeing everybody again. And uh, I guess wish you all the best. To Merry Christmas and have a have a good uh, good holiday. <clears throat> and uh, we'll catch I don't have the date in front of me of when our next meeting is. Uh, but the calendar, like I said, is available on the website. So we'll we'll catch up with everybody in, uh, well, I'm sure on Groups I.O., but uh, in uh, January as well. January the 4th. First Wednesday. January the 4th. And I think you're the guy that's up in January, aren't you? Mm, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, maybe I should have made all of them all of them your color. And you would do every one, right? Anyway. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate it. And uh, Merry Christmas. And we'll catch up with you in January. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Merry Christmas, everybody. Hey, Peter. Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas. Well, next year. Kevin. Happy Peter, year. Eric. Merry you Christmas. guys around? Yep. Peter, yeah. Eric, stick around, please. Yeah. Sure. Just give me a minute to refill because I know you're going to be heavy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Guys, Merry Christmas. Hey, Dave, are you still there? I feel it's, it's, like, a, it's like a detention, you know, being held behind.